Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us tonight for Go Native in Your Backyard. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sam Adams Lanham. I am the Community Engagement Librarian here in the Barrington area, which means I work with and for the benefit of our local nonprofits. Um, so Susan and I have, have known each other for a while and have worked on various things. This may be um, one of the first times that we've presented a program together. So, um, so I'm excited for that. It'll be a lot of fun. We are, as I mentioned, we are recording tonight. So we do ask for the sake of everyone's bandwidth and for the quality of the recording, if you would please leave your screen off and leave yourself muted. Um, Dave will answer some questions at the end of his presentation. So the easiest way to make that work, since we're asking you to stay muted, is for you to put your questions into the chat. Um, and you can put them in the chat whenever they occur to you as he's speaking, um, but we weren't, aren't gonna pose any questions to him until, until he's done with his presentation. And then I will read those to him and he will answer for us. Um, so with that, I am going to turn things over to Susan. Um, I will say, if any of you know, have friends who registered for the program this evening and are saying they didn't get the link, I sent the link again about 10 minutes to seven, but we, I think, had 50 or 60 people register today. Um, so please feel free to go ahead and share the link if you have friends that you know registered and are telling you that they didn't get it. I will send it again now while Susan is speaking, but, but you can also go that route. So with that, Susan. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Sam. I really appreciate it. So um, my name is Susan Lenz. I'm the Executive Director of Conservation for the Barrington Area Conservation Trust. Um, we are a local land trust. Um, we were founded in 2001. We have uh, preserved uh, over 520 acres in the greater Barrington area. And our mission is to um, preserve our community's rare and exceptional open spaces um, for current and future generations. So um, pleased, as Sam said, to be co-hosting this today and excited. Um, Dave Eubanks um, is one of our restoration specialists and contractors that works on our nature preserves. And he also works with landowners in the area. So excited to hear his presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, my name is David Eubanks and uh, ecologist as well as um, um, a planner of, of land and land use. Um, what I'm going to do today is try to bring uh, the whole concept and some national of bringing nature into your yard and into your backyard, into your front yard, into your side yard. And the idea here is that um, you can be a pioneer and it's really picking up um, in terms of uh, a real change in the landscape ethic. We were very used to bringing in foreign plants uh, into our, our uh, yards and domains uh, from the early time the settlers came and uh, they had kind of an English garden mentality of bringing plants from all over the world and showing off those plants. Uh, today, the movement is more towards the ecological function and benefit of having native plants um, as part of uh, local suburbia, our cities, our residences where we live, uh, work and play. And the idea of having native plants is um, really catching on because we're recognizing that biodiversity um, is in trouble in some ways throughout the, the world as well as um, in, in terms of the United States. And uh, the, one of the key opportunities for land uh, to be linked to animals and plants um, and wildlife and insects and pollinators uh, is to bring or native plants into your um, own setting. And that's uh, really making a difference at home. Um, I wanna thank the Barrington Area Library for putting this on as well as uh, BACT or Barrington Area Conservation Trust who you can volunteer for and support. It's a wonderful nonprofit that does some great work in the Barrington area and come out in the preserves and, and actually get out in nature and uh, do some things from 
uh, cutting invasive buckthorn, uh, planting trees, uh, collecting prairie seed and spreading that seed and doing a lot of fun things. So uh, I really encourage you to um, work with that, uh, work with that nonprofit, as well as others uh, that work in the in the region and uh, throughout. But we're really going to focus on uh, bringing nature into your landscape. So right now I'm going to uh, engage in a PowerPoint. Uh, that will last about 40 minutes. I go through the slides somewhat quickly, but um, I think you'll get the idea of the images and um, the concepts as we go through. Um, thank you, and here we go. And then we'll take some, some um, uh, questions at the end. I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with me. And uh, again, I'm Dave Eubanks. Okay, so the first slide and basically um, we're going to talk a little bit about ecological design and planting the natural way and uh, those are our sponsors uh, the Barrington Area Conservation Trust and Barrington Area Library. Thank you very much. So um, the concept for a Chicago region is that there's a wilderness here, believe it or not. The forest preserve districts, uh, some of the park districts have gone native in many ways. Uh, the forest preserve system started over a century ago Dave, and yes Dave, I'm sorry this is Sam we're not seeing your your PowerPoint if we're supposed to be right now oh really I'm sorry yeah oh that's okay that's Thank okay you. um uh it says start share screen share screen and then okay the PowerPoint slideshow okay let's try this now and then it'll ask you yeah. click share. thank you there we go thank you oh. Sorry, folks, that this is uh, new to me a little bit. So uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, but there's our hosts again. Um, and um, let's see here. Okay, so I was talking about the Chicago wilderness region being a region uh, full of forest preserves that uh, connect uh, some beautiful, beautiful cats that were undestroyed and in some cases very pristine. Uh, but in between all of that land are people, um, you know, seven, eight million of us uh, that live live throughout the region, work here, shop here, have built on the land. There's still plenty of farmland, not a lot, but some farmland. But the idea is to connect the wilderness together uh, through green infrastructure. And you being a part of that at home uh, is, is a key role. Chicago Wilderness is an actual organization of more than 250 organizations that uh, uh, their motto is to protect nature and enrich life. And you can learn about that organization at www.chicagowilderness.org. But it's to, to link the entire uh, Chicago region as well, in, as well into southeastern um, Wisconsin and northwestern Indiana. So it's um, one of the key opportunities for uh, leading uh, a metropolitan region into uh, coexistence with nature. Chicago seems like an oxymoron, right? We have skyscrapers and everything else, but we also have native woodlands, we have native wetlands and native prairie. And those are the, the three major uh, natural communities of the Chicago region. Native woodlands uh, obviously are dominated by oaks and hickories. Um, in the springtime, we get these beautiful ephemerals, Solomon seals in this picture, just starting to grow up. Um, woodland flocks, red trillium, may apples. You may have seen these, these types of plants. If you haven't, I encourage you to get out to a woodland, oak woodland at, a, at, at anyone you can find and enjoy yourself. Um, the Rowland Savannah up here in Lake County has uh, a great example of uh, these scattered oaks across the landscape. But woodlands can be more tightly packed as well. So woodlands is a term for um, a, a, a variety of different ways that forests and open woods can, can uh, evolve. Native wetlands, that's our second community, plant community. Um, obviously it's inundation. There's inundation, uh, there's specialized plants that can deal with aquatics, with rising waters and uh, um, that uh, uh, recede. And then there's native prairies and prairies are an open grassland. It's not dominated, it's dominated by grasses and not trees, 
uh, trees are either absent or widely scattered on the landscape. Now we used to have prairies covering uh, an, was over 2,400 miles stretched from Alberta and Saskatchewan all the way through the Great Plains down into Texas, Texas and even Mexico. Um, that was a phenomenal uh, span from Indiana all the way to the Rocky Mountains, uh, covered 1.4 million square miles. That was uh, America's true, true native wilderness. Uh, what happened uh, was that we farmed and farming uh, changed uh, the landscape quite dramatically. And for example, in Illinois today, there's only one one hundredth of one percent of the original prairie. So we're, we're left with remnants. And we, as ecologists, we, we try to interpret those plants and, and bring uh, recovery back to the areas that we do have. Uh, this is some Prairie Grove in Cook County, which was ground zero for uh, volunteers uh, restoring, cutting out buckthorn and uh, uh, creating uh, native, native habitat in prairie. This is a fall shot. Uh, the, the big leaf there is um, a wonderful plant called prairie dock. And uh, there's all sorts of, of uh, life in a, in a prairie life. So um, you'll find all types of pollinators, all types of insects, uh, all types of um, you name it, uh, that's, that's where life, life in a natural world happens. So in terms of the three ecosystems I just described, we have prairie, we have woodland, and we have wetland. Why am I spending some time on this? Um, is the reason I'm spending time on this is that to bring native plants into your home, you have to be aware that your yard has many areas. Some are shady, like a woodland, some may be wet, where it ponds up, particularly in the spring and fall, that's a wetland. And you may have just dry, full sun areas, and that could be a potential uh, place where you can plant prairie species. So uh, understanding the natural community and bringing them in is why I'm spending some time. Now, our natural communities did evolve with fire. Fire kept uh, things uh, full of nutrients. Um, it kept out invading different plants that are alien and um, that uh, is a natural force uh, that um, the prairies are known for. So wetlands, woodlands, and prairie. If there's nothing else, you'll remember that. Now, this is a common scene along many of our roadways. And this is not, <laughs> this is not natural. This is a ecological disaster, European buckthorn and teasel. And uh, these are not the plants that you want in your yard ever. Uh, for any reason. Now, a lot of people love the buckthorn for screening. Believe me, there are fine native shrubs and trees and plants that can do a much better ecological job than buckthorn. So uh, we have these thickets along our roadways. As you can see, this is a, a, a forest preserve. And uh, what it does is it chokes the ground la layer out. There's no sunlight down there and nothing can grow. So there's erosion and the oak acorns that need light and air cannot get it. Uh, so those oaks that you see up at the top canopy, those are terminal oaks in many instances. When they die, the buckthorn will basically create a monoculture of just that one species, and that's your new woodland. And uh, again, it's a, it's a dumbing down of nature. So cutting that out and restoring it um, to me looks better, maybe not the cars in this photo, but it, it certainly looks better. Looks, uh, more inviting to, to me. Uh, it's a new landscape ethic that people are getting used to, but uh, more and more you'll drive along for to see scattered oaks and sunlight dappling in throughout uh, a much larger acreage. These are not prairies. So when you see a, a field of Queen Anne's lace, that's not a prairie. Uh, you see a, a field of white sweet clover where this little kid is, that's not prairie. Um, you, she's being swallowed, she's being eaten by the white sweet clover. Um, there's um, a Phragmites, which is common reed that's in wetlands, it kind of has a tiger's tail, you've seen it, and that's not native, that's not a native wetland. Uh, and certainly thistle in the bottom left-hand corner, that, that's not native. So 
the socioeconomic benefits, there's erosion control, stormwater benefits. But one of the key things is, is the wildlife component. Um, the native insects and birds, um, mammals have uh, evolved with these landscapes that we're here for millennium. And they, um, they depend on them. They're evolved to eat those, those plants. Um, the Home Depot kind of, uh, I don't mean to pick on Home Depot, but go to any of the big box stores and you'll see their landscape section is filled with plants from different continents um, and di different countries. Our insects cannot eat those plants for the most part. Um, so there's a crash effect going on where the insect level starts to crash, your birds start to be eliminated, uh, bird species are in trouble um, in some of them. So um, by, um, by doing your part at home, it can make a big difference. Native plants are very deep rooted, so they can survive an ecological event such as a fire. Um, weeds, as they get established, um, they um, aerate the soil and some of those root systems can go down to 15 feet, um, which is an amazing kind of uh, feat. And what can all those fibrous roots do? Well, they can stop this. This is erosion where I worked at the Chicago Botanic Garden as an aquatic uh, consultant back in 1997. And the Japanese islands were basically being uh, sloughed off. Turf grass has a three inch root system. And it was just the up and down action of the water was pulling, pulling that right into the drink. And the Botanic Garden was losing acres, literally acres of their collection into their lagoon system. So we did uh, a lot of studies, we, we measured erosion and you can see the effect, you can see that one pipe in the middle of this uh, slide that's going out to about 20 feet. They've lost you know, uh, 15, 20 feet of shoreline. So bringing in native plants, however, starts to stabilize those systems. And you go from this to this, purple cone flower, native, native sedges, native grasses. Um, this is a plant called pickerel weed and um, uh, there's a large bulrush in the background. So um, these are the, the plants that start to, to, start to um, solidify the ground again and hold those banks. So you can't, you can't buy better erosion control than nature. I tried to do the same thing with uh, ponds that I work on at homes uh, or retention ponds in, in subdivisions. And uh, uh, this is in Northfield, a, a site that uh, obviously had major erosion, just like the Botanic Garden. Uh, one to one slope. Um, the the uh, uh, the topsoil had washed to the bottom of the drink, so we brought in um, a coconut log to hold the the uh, toe of the slope, the bank, and put down new brought in new topsoils, put down seed, and live plants were cut through an erosion blanket, and uh, the water level started coming back up, and we started to get plants. This was the first growing season. And um, um, as time progressed, again, we started to see native plants um, and go in. So the solution uh, to a goose poop pond, so to speak, with turf grass um, uh, down to the water um, to populate a slope with native plants. Here's an example of a, a client to work with on the lake that I live in Lake County, um, where we took an oak, an oak system and uh, Re regenerated it. And this does not mean you have to give up all your lawn. Obviously, you know, there's plenty of lawn left and um, you get a happy client. So introducing plants, you can plant plugs for an ornamental look, install them by hand or with an auger, and you can seed and broadcast seed uh, in the fall or early spring is best uh, for putting plants in the ground. And there's um, uh, a, um, a maintenance schedule uh, just like any gardening uh, for doing native plants in terms of when you might uh, do weed control, uh, when you might hand pull certain plants that come up, uh, best times to put in trees and shrubs. And uh, again, this will be recorded, so feel free to borrow this, this uh, task calendar. Um, I've worked at a subdivision for almost a decade now, and um, uh, basically the common areas have gone natural and native, and we put in lots of native seed and managed it. 
we've actually conducted um, on the right days with professionals trained to do burns where the smoke goes up and away from homes. Uh, we've been able to do fire management and uh, the result I think kind of speaks for itself. Now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty of your backyard or your front yard or your side yard. And how do you do this? Well, this is taking a natural scale. And this was one of my uh, early clients uh, um, in, in Green Oaks where uh, the client had a very strong interest in going native, uh, started to uh, go to, to uh, plant sales in Lake County Forest Preserve and other uh, organizations and started uh, for Mother's Day present, giving herself uh, a, a flat of native plants that she would put in. At one point, she wanted to do more than that. So uh, we connected and um, decided to ring the backyard with a prairie, put in a front, uh, a front yard butterfly garden and cut out the buckthorn along the back and um, uh, essentially um, remove the turf to create uh, a butterfly garden. So this is not unlike any other landscaping where you basically mark your gardens. Uh, you can use a garden hose or a big heavy rope and get some nice curves in there. And uh, soil prep is, is uh, somewhat important. Uh, I do use herbicide to kill turf that one time application. Uh, some people can use cardboard uh, and mulch uh, to kill turf. That's another technique where you put down cardboard and you put leaf mulch on top, for example. But I usually uh, herbicide turf and then burn it off. And then um, sometimes if the ground is hard or hard pan, you might do a very, very shallow rototill. Uh, but sometimes that's not even necessary. Uh, you bring in your plants. We brought in a thousand different trees, shrubs, baby plants, and uh, got ready to make some differences. You install your plants first. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, we, we did bring in leaf mulch first and um, brought in uh, woody plants and got those, got those established. And then we brought in our perennials and started to plant those. Um, the design principle is not very different from any type of landscaping where you wanna build from a lower plant level up to, for example, a spine in the middle uh, that, that will be taller plants. And you want to select plants for all seasons, uh, spring, summer, and fall. And you oftentimes want a matrix of grasses that can, can hold up certain plants when they're in bloom or not in bloom. So um, that's, um, that's kind of the organizing principle of, of doing lines. And this was early on in about uh, two months down the road where the plants started to take root. Some bloom even the first year. And then um, towards the end of the season, that first season, we have a nine bark in beautiful bloom there. And nine bark is the shrub, common nine bark, uh, just has these magnificent white flowers. It's a real rugged shrub and um, it's, a, it's a beauty and it will, it will, it will get uh, six, eight feet tall. So just remember it uh, kind of spirals out with these, with these showy flowers when it's in bloom. So um, now that we used a variety of different grasses, there's a, a blue eyed grass here, uh, prairie drop seed. Um, we've used a, a purple love grass on the lower left hand side, which has this airy kind of purplish hue to it. June grass for um, is a short, uh, another short grass that um, is underused uh, at times, but it, it handles really hot conditions. So if you had like a sidewalk that's get full blast of west sun, um, that that's that's a, a good plant. Um, and we use downspout areas. We uh, we would extend the downspouts out. Sometimes cover the plastic uh, tube. We perforate that and feed uh, different plants. Um, that's another technique. You can even do raised beds to the top right. Um, it, um, native plants can go anywhere that uh, any other plants can. So people are starting to learn about this. They're curious. Um, and I, I think it's a great movement. It's a great thing that you're here because I, I think uh, nature's best hope is, is to bring these plants into your backyard. Now, four, four or five years down the road, you're gonna have quite a lush existence. These were plants that started 
two and a half inches wide. And you can see uh, they've really, really taken off. So um, this is, a, a, again, a butterfly garden that's alive with many, many different, uh, different uh, insects and birds. And they come to feed off of uh, purple coneflower. The hummingbirds will come in, for example. So I want to start thinking of your home as an ecological management site, um, just like a forest preserve. You're bringing in trees for, for life, canopy trees, but you also may bring in understory trees, shrubs, and then you have your herbaceous layer, uh, your ground layer. So these are your different, your different uh, ways to structure what is essentially going to be your feeder. Um, and it uh, is, a, is a natural bird feeder. Nothing wrong with having your bird feeder, but uh, uh, keep it clean and uh, and or plant plant all these different different plants. Want to give you just some ideas of what what some of the shrubs that we did put in put in American filbert, also known as hazelnut, black chokeberry, black haw viburnum, bladdernut, uh, which is populated uh, pollinated by a moth at night. It's an interesting plant. Button bush is a wetland plant that's uh, uh, kind of has a Sputnik flower, common witch hazel, uh, elderberry, nannyberry, nine bark, shrubby St. John's wort, and spice bush, some winterberry, just a, a, a short sampling of shrubs. Uh, later in the, in the uh, broadcast here, we'll give you some nursery sources that you can, can find these plants because they're not fine sometimes. Uh, we put in blue beech, an intermediary, intermediary tree, and that is um, uh, also known as muscle wood. It's an incredible bark. Uh, put in a bur oak, berry, a pagoda, a shack bark hickory, and a swamp white oak. So this is in one yard. Uh, put in 17 shrubs, nine trees, and all the plants that, that uh, you saw. Plus we seeded. This is what a brand new prairie kind of looks like. It's gonna be filled with uh, black-eyed Susans mostly, and grasses coming up, maybe a few coneflowers, uh, sunflowers. Um, and, uh, it's definitely worth doing, and there's a, a plant list um, available too uh, if you get this recorded. So um, this, we wanted a border um, that was distinct and kind of um, kept uh, the dog in, in, in the yard, so to speak. And we use tall grass. So the Indian grass you can see here is one of the taller grasses. Now, a tall grass prairie is good if you've got some space. If you don't have space, then you would go with a short grass prairie. So instead of having Indian grass and big blue stem grass, which can grow eight feet, seven feet tall, um, you'd want to put in little blue stem, which is hip high um, uh, or side oats grama. Uh, plants like that, prairie drop seed, those, uh, um, those are much shorter grasses and are uh, sometimes more appropriate for tight spaces that are residential in character. So as the prairie matures, you can see um, it quite, it's quite stunning, I think. Um, it's definitely a different look. Uh, again, this came all from seed. So you can do plugs, they're a little more expensive, um, depending on how many more expensive, but uh, you can get a decent prairie from seed. It's going to take you three years before it really starts looking like a prairie because it spends so much time putting its roots down in the ground, but uh, it's definitely worth having. This was done, this butterfly garden was done all in the with life plugs. So this was not seeded. So that's a little more architected. So five years down the road. And the backyard uh, around the home received a, a whole variety of different wildflowers. And this is a plant called New England Aster. There are asters that are a little shorter, uh, but if you have some room, a New England Aster is a pretty stunning plant in October. Um, and um, uh, Virginia water leaf and uh, blue flag iris and uh, uh, a variety of, of a golden Alexander and a, and a choke cherry in the back. So a nice short stature. Uh, and this, this uh, got limited, more limited north facing sun. So there's, um, uh, this was the client and uh, uh, Louise Wood. And she received the very first uh, uh, Conserve Lake County uh, Conservation at Home for Lake County. 
and uh, I had a pleasure of working with her. She's a wonderful person. And uh, Conserve Lake County is now part of Open Lands. So for kids now, a little prairie from seed, you can do this part. You don't have to have uh, a half acre or an acre lot. Uh, this was a much smaller lot in Grays Lake. And um, again, it came up from seed and the kids uh, have a good time. So growing up with a prairie might be very, very interesting for all the critters and birds that come in. And I think it raises a, a child's um, uh, awareness of nature. So uh, this is another project uh, that we did with volunteers, uh, Brushwood, uh, the Brushwood Center at Ryerson Woods. Uh, again, we uh, took the old mansion there from the Ryerson family and uh, turned it, um, uh, we went native for the most part. And the yellow shrub by the windows is a beautiful shrubby St. John's ward, it's called, has this yellow, uh, yellow flower that blooms that attracts bees by the dozens. And guess what came almost instantly to feed on the bees was a scarlet tanager that had, hadn't uh, been around the building very much. So, um, you know, life happens uh, when you plant these plants. It's, it's going, you'll, you'll, see, you'll, see things, you'll see things going on. Uh, one of the coolest milkweed species for our monarch butterfly is uh, a butterfly. It's really quite stunning. And the milkweed family is, is, is the only uh, family uh, host plant for the, for the monarch. So if you squeeze in milkweed, please do it in your yard. Our monarchs need it for their journey from Canada to Mexico. You can put it in small spaces up, up along uh, very narrow spaces. You can find the right native plant for the right place. I'm going to talk a little bit about rain gardens. And um, uh, this was a client with a very small backyard um, next to a, a, a larger conservation area in Haynesville. And uh, want, uh, the client wanted uh, a couple rain gardens off the roof. So we marked a couple areas, a path down the center. And uh, basically, this is, this is something you could do at home, is run, run a tube out to off, off your downspouts into small little depressional areas and uh, plant cardinal flower and blue lobelia um, and turtle's head. And uh, um, you can start to get yourself uh, these, these little areas that uh, can take a lot of water and then not so much water. So, um, and you can do a hardscape down it however you want. This was their choice. And uh, uh, we use leaf mulch. And, uh, oh, that's my male model. I only hire male models to help me uh, install plants, by the way, hot, Mr. Hot Stuff. So um, basically, this is what happens. We get, uh, we get uh, um, uh, a couple of years down the road, we start to really see uh, a natural garden that, that comes, comes out. So pond hardscaping, you can do this, you can put nature in and around any type of hardscape. Um, and native plants. And you can use a whole variety of benches and uh, we recycled of stonework that uh, the client had uh, created kind of a, uh, a central um, medicine wheel, so to speak, and um, uh, filled it with pea gravel. And she put up a nice, um, a nice uh, totem pole and away you go. Now I'd like to just talk, spend a little time on the residential scale. I mean, on the institutional scale, we can take natives and we created a memorial garden at St. Gregory's Church, Episcopal Church in Deerfield at Wilmot and, and Deerfield Road. And uh, this was um, an area that uh, essentially they went all native and we did this with Eagle Scouts, uh, an Eagle Scout family that, um, um, provided all the labor, we did the design, and uh, we, we put in um, a whole, you know, native oaks, uh, prairie drop seed, obviously showy black-eyed Susan, uh, liatris, uh, put in the common nine bark that I love, a blue beech, um, and we started to um, landscape around this church. And there's a lot of symbolism that goes into uh, this kind of thing for churches or synagogues. Um, the idea here was also to create a memorial garden, you know, for urn burial 
and, um, and, and ceremonies. So we created an ellipse uh, around uh, the central feature here and uh, created areas where ashes could be um, broadcast as well uh, for families and, um, and created quite a, quite a, a new feature. This is a, a dirty granite, uh, crushed granite uh, uh, path that uh, I think really makes an attractive ellipse uh, for uh, doing kind of a formal, a formal garden, but using native plants. So the, um, the concept, um, again, is basically as these mature and fill in, you've got a real lush sense of, of how native plants can, can change. Uh, this is a, a native rose um, uh, in, in, uh, with the rose hips right in front here. And prairie drop seed, um, blue indigo, and um, um, obviously a lot of showy black-eyed Susans. Now, we came across the second year a little surprise that uh, the church didn't tell me about <laughs> was that they flooded spring. So we started having plants die off and uh, we had the, you know, these ponds to deal with uh, in big rains. So phase two was Eagle Scout number two in the same family. Um, we decided to move that water and, and switch it over to another area that they had. Instead of going down a pipe and creating more to the flood, flood uh, issues in Deerfield, um, we basically uh, used the water on site with plants. And again, called rain gardens, which is uh, the buzzword. So uh, we used a, 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 a swale that fed this large loop of different plants. So we didn't use a ton of species, but we used the, everything from Christmas fern, which keeps its leaves all the way green through Christmas. Uh, we had black eyed Susans, uh, we had turtle head, fox sedge, cardinal flower, blue flag eye flower, great blue lobelia um, as, um, as our matrix. So uh, we kept it relatively simple. And uh, that's some of the bot. Now, uh, the Eagle Scout had an uncle in the contracting business who came out to dig our rain garden. So uh, that helps quite a bit and uh, stripped all the grass off, all the turf, actually buried it uh, at the bottom of the site. And that's one nice thing if you've got a braider. And uh, Eagle Scouts came out and we prepared the soil, dug a nice uh, 20, this is only about 18 to 24 inches in its depth. So rain garden is not a pond per se. It's a place where water can store periodically. Um, it, it sometimes will dry up in the, in the summer and many times it'll be wet or moist and certainly the, the rain when rains uh, brought in a a lot of leaf mulch, real nice organic material for mulching beds. It has a very dark color steaming in the fall. We put, planted this project just last fall, uh, brought in 800 different plants, as I mentioned, and used an auger to dig the holes. These were pint-sized plants that we brought in uh, from the natural garden. Uh, it's a wholesale nursery that I use, um, also, uh, also called Midwest Ground Covers. and. Um, started planting all these blue flag iris down the center of this swale uh, and uh, the area where it's going to be most wet and then put stuff like purple cone flower and uh, uh, we put those those plants up in the higher edges and the, obviously the Christmas fern you don't want to put that in in the basin but in the basin would go your uh, your cardinal flower which is red and beautiful and its cousin Blue, blue lobelia, great blue lobelia, blue, blue flag iris, um, and so turtle head was another one. So uh, these are the plants that went in and um, a new rain garden for St. Gregory's. So if you're ever in that Deerfield region, walk around the, the Memorial Garden. It's open to the public. Uh, enjoy yourself. Um, it's, a, it's a nice con contemplative space and one proud Eagle Scout his wings. So um, this can also be done at highway departments. 
and how many of us have homes with um, planting beds that don't look quite the best. <laughs> Some government buildings don't have planting beds that look the best. Some of our homes don't have planting beds that look the best. They're somewhat devoid, they're somewhat boring. There might be one obligatory species or two uh, shrubs. And uh, what we do again, same process. We bring in these baby plants and uh, get them going and they start to leap over time. So we go from that to that and we have uh, much more of a, a, a life-giving uh, government building. These are just some of the species, the grasses that you can use, um, little blue stem, northern drop seed, purple love grass, June grass, common oak sedge for um, shady areas, um, straight styled wood sedge or curly styled wood sedge, uh, Carex rosea, Carex radiata are both wonderful uh, for uh, those shady spots. And um, pack, pack those areas with these types of plants and away you go. And these were just some of the plants that we used uh, uh, through there. Uh, get, your, get your wings here and decide to do this at home. Um, you will find uh, there are different plants for prairies, different plants for woodlands and different plants for wet areas. So this is more for a, a, a sunny prairie-like uh, conditions. Last project I'll look at was, uh, this is in Northfield again, this was a project where the developer wanted a Rocky Mountain kind of look. Uh, the only problem is that we don't have Rocky Mountain runoff, <laughs> clean runoff from the mountains. We have agriculture runoff that's usually filled with nutrients that creates algae problems. So, of having this, we came up with a plant solution and we seeded native plants into the mix, uh, put in lots of plugs, and uh, it's a very different look uh, today than it, it was. So this can be done, you know, again, on a larger scale for many homes. Uh, it can be done on the individual scale. It can be done on the institutional scale. And uh, again, you'll have a lot of visitors that uh, you wouldn't expect. So order your plant material, and here's a few places where you can get, um, sometimes you can get a prepackaged little kit, a little prairie, um, for example, a butterfly garden kit or a rain garden kit. Um, many of these nurseries uh, will, will, will guide you if you, if you want to, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, uh, or you uh, hire or call a guy like me to help you with uh, doing this kind of, this kind of work. But uh, in either case, I, I definitely encourage you to try, try it out, uh, find your space, make your space more livable, um, and uh, garden as if life depends on it. Um, there's a, a great book called Bringing Nature, Nature Home uh, and another book called Nature's Best Hope by an entomologist named Doug Ptolemy. Uh, and he signed his book, Garden as if Life Depends on It, because it does. This is a tiny little bur oak that we planted. And uh, up to 900 years, they can live. They can host 534 species of caterpillar um, and feed mammals. And uh, I think that uh, wouldn't it be amazing if uh, you know there was an oak planted in your yard and 500 years later, it's um, ringing over the house. So um, that's my presentation for tonight. I hope you, you you gain something, we'll take some questions. And um, um, again, thanks to the Barrington Area Conservation Trust. I really uh, think they're a great organization. So, um, and the Barrington Library. So thank you very much. And um, um, I think, uh, you should be able to end share and then I will also spotlight my video. And we okay. do have a few questions come in. So. Very good, there I am. <laughs> here okay. you are, we've okay. got you. So um, first off, I'm hearing from a bunch of people and I actually got text messages from people I work with. Um, obviously the people who are here got the link okay. I did send the link out three times today. So I'm not sure what happened. Um, but we are recording this. If you have friends who are upset that they've missed it, 
it will be recorded. It will be on the library's YouTube channel as quickly as I can get it up there. Again, like I said, I sent it at 10 a.m. I sent it at 6 p.m. and I sent it again a couple minutes after seven. So I don't know what happened, um, but my apologies. So um, I'm gonna give you the last question first. That's okay. Asked, which is, would you please share your information for people who have a yard? Share my my information, like how can you get a hold your of company. me? Your, oh, my yeah. company's Eubanks Environmental um, at dot com. Uh, phone number is 847-456-5604. And i um, happy to, this is what I do for a living. And um, I, I look at it more as a mission. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of how I go about things. Okay, great. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, so one of the first questions that came in was about Buckthorn, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, after cutting or removing buckthorn, do you need to use chemicals to control growth or prevent regrowth? Um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, there are people that are um, very, very against using herbicide or chemicals. Um, there have been experiments putting plastic bags over a cut stem. Um, and uh, I suppose that, that if it's a heavy duty black plastic bag, that might work, but in practical sense, it's kind of like um, uh, you know surgery. Sometimes it's not pretty; um, you have to do it, um, and sometimes radiation is necessary for cancer patients. Um, I somewhat look at it in a medical way that uh, the small amount of topical herbicide that's used to kill buckthorn, and there's a, a, a chemical called triclofer, and um, it does do the job and it stays right with the root system that it's applied to. So judicious use, responsible use um, uh, of herbicide is recommended uh, so that your buckthorn won't roar back, which it will do if you just cut it and leave it. You'll be back, it'll be back. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. Um, for people who are asking, yes, we will share the link to the recorded presentation, but honestly, with the challenges that we had for whatever reason with the emails with the Zoom link getting out. I will also just tell you, if you go to the library's homepage, scroll down to the bottom left, there's a link to our YouTube channel um, and it will, because it will be the most recently posted one, it will be right near the top. We do have a section that is entirely um, garden and environmental programs we've done. We've been fortunate to do several of them this season. So, so those are there. Um, one of the next questions that came in was, um, if people are starting rain gardens or using, um, I, I'm thinking this is maybe like using rain barrels that you know collect from the gutter, um, should we be concerned about chemicals coming off of the roof? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I suppose that there's a, a small chance of that. Um, I'm not the best uh, chemist to know what asphalt product might be involved with shingles, for example. But um, my guess is that I've seen rain bar barrels being used over and over and over again. And uh, plants have, uh, like BACT, for example, we've done, uh, we've used rain barrels and we've watered lots of plugs and they've lived just fine. So plants are, native plants are pretty tough, pretty tough customers. So I wouldn't be concerned about that. Yeah, my guess is it would probably be either at the very beginning of the shingles lifespan that it might be a problem or at the very end when things are starting to break down. So, right. yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. We have some questions about, um, and you said you, you um, used Roundup and then burning it off to clear the turf, to clear the turf. Yeah, oh. to get down to the seed level layer. And that's literally yeah. burning it. I literally, I literally use a torch, um, the propane torch, and light it on fire and let it burn across. Now that's me, and I'm a fire professional, but um, you don't have to necessarily do that. You could weed whack it down to the nub, but you don't want a lot of duff in between your seed and the soil. S you want seed soil contact directly to promote, um, to promote uh, native, native uh, generation um, or germination. So um, it, now the seed will eventually wash through 
a dead turf matrix, but I'd like to make it a little easier uh, for the seed to get a start. So that's the reason that I that I burn it off. I know it's a it's maybe an unorthodox technique, but it's what I it's it's my intuitive nature to burn things. So that's the way it goes. Interesting. Okay. Um, fair. Um, we have a few questions. Um, I have someone who asks about the seasonal task planner. And I think Dave and I will try to work to get that, um, to find some way to link. To, I mean, it will be on the recording, but we'll try to find a way to link to maybe a PDF of it or something, if that's yeah. okay. I'll get you a file, no problem. Yeah, yeah I think it might be, might be a little tough to share again right now. Um, there's some questions about educating landowners, um, mm -hmm. how to get landscapers, contractors to understand, be educated, change their methods, supply these natives, it's hard to find local suppliers. And I have somebody who put an answer to that in the chat, but I will ask you to answer it first. Okay, um, it, it's, it's an up and coming um, portion of the landscape industry. Uh, mm -hmm. More and more um, uh, landscape architects are getting trained in this. Um, more environmental scientists are getting trained in this uh, field. Um, stormwater management agencies now require native plants around detention and retention ponds. For example, in Lake County, DuPage County, almost all of the, our counties are moving in that direction because they realize that for just for basic erosion control and water quality, a native habitat is, is much better. It's coming along. Um, I've been at this almost 30 years and I've seen I've seen a, a major shift, but it's not where it needs to be. We need a kind of a quantum leap. And I think that's where the backyards can, can come into play. So two things that um, I might just offer in response to that. One is, and this is, um, somebody threw this into the chat, that Citizens for Conservation, which is one of the other environmental groups in the Barrington area, has their native plant sale going on now. Oh, very good. Um, and, uh, it's scheduled pickups. They are not, in, in past years, they've done, you know, you can order in advance and schedule, you know, schedule roughly when you want to pick it up, or you can just go during the sale and buy what looks appealing to you. They're not doing that second option this year, right? It's all yep. scheduled. You have to order in advance and then schedule a time to pick your items up. But, um, but that is an option in addition to the I think there were five that you gave us on screen. Yes, and, and um, I'm aware that Open Lands is uh, selling with Possibility Place Nursery. Okay. Uh, they, are, they are offering uh, gallon containers of shrubs and trees that, right. can be, that can be shipped. Now they'll, they'll be small, but they will grow. And um, you might want to protect them from rabbits the first couple years, uh, but for the most part, um, um, that's, or you can go out to Moni and uh, uh, get yourself a larger plant from, from that nursery, but it's in Moni, Illinois, and it's a drive. Okay. So um, it, what would be a dream of mine would be if you could go to the Home Depot and get some of these plants. Yeah. Um, if we haven't seen that change yet um, in terms of retail, retail nurseries are not selling native plants nearly to the extent that they could or should. Um, but I think it's a it's a it's a it's a demand. It's an educational lag, and I, I do think it's it's going to come on stronger, for sure. Um, I'm finding a client shift right now where a lot of younger couples that have bought their first home or their second home ha are wanting to use native plants. So I think there's a better environmental education going on um, uh, with the younger generation too. Yeah, we're almost at that tipping point where yes. yeah, it will get easier and easier to find. Um, the second thing that I was going to mention was um, I did a program in March um, with a gentleman who lives in, uh, I don't know if it was Deer Park or another community in the Barrington area um, that did, um, was having flooding issues and used some of the methods that you showed us to mm -hmm. alleviate that um and where they got grants from the lake county um yeah i'm not sure. stormwater management commission stormwater management. that's it yeah so mm -hmm. there is a um 
a video of that that is available on our website as well, um, stormwater management. And the, the gentleman who did, who gave the presentation said, I'm a project manager. I am not a plant guy. So here are the lists that they told me of the plants that we bought. I'm here to tell you about the process and how we help to change people's minds. Right. Know, and, and demonstrate what it did. So, so a few things. Um, you mentioned rabbits. So I have somebody who's asking about, um, you know, are native plants more or less likely to be deer resistant? Well, you know, it all depends on the species. I won't say that deer won't eat native plants. They evolve to eat native plants, so they will. Um, they, they will browse some, um, but I have uh, planted next to forest preserves, next to natural areas, and most, most all of the gardens have not experienced serious issues uh, related to uh, deer browsing. Um, but a deer will love a tulip just as much as they'll, you know, love a, a coneflower, for example. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it, is, it is possible that you'll get some browsing. The nice thing about uh, native gardens is that once they're established, they're so dense, there's so much of it that um, the browsing doesn't, doesn't seem to be out of place. I, I like a lush, fully planted garden as it comes together. As you can tell. <laughs> They're beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I assume kind of a similar answer for there are definitely native plants that are adapted to clay soils. Right. There's a question right. that came in. Yeah. Yep. There's, uh, there's a lot of uh, the nice thing about prairie plants, for example, is they can bust through clay um, and, and eventually get their roots down and in and through clay. It takes a while, but they can do it. Okay. Um, which is nice. So if you have really poor soils, don't despair. There's there's prairie plants on the way. Okay. There you go. Um, let me, we have somebody who, um, I'm going to read a whole paragraph to you. Sure. Um, they have a gently sloping yard going down into a pond. Um, very interested in doing some shoreline restoration, but nervous about putting herbicides right along the water's edge. Some of the grass sits under the water. Um, how would you go about removing the grasses that sit at the water's edge? Well, typically um, the herbicide that, that I use is aquatic approved. It doesn't affect or impact amphibians or fish or microinvertebrates. So, um, and, and I've, I've had no problems doing projects related to that. Um, and, and usually you, you want to, um, wait for the, the water to be at a lower level before you herbicide okay. level. But in, in, in general, um, that's, that's one, one technique that, that I've had, or one product I've used that I've had no trouble with. You, do you remember the brand name off the top of your head? Do you mind sharing that? Uh, I can. It's called Roundup Custom. Again, I do use Roundup products, and I haven't sprouted a third eye yet. Uh, but that's, it could come. But uh, if you, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer if you use proper protective equipment, you know, if you can prevent people from getting coronavirus, you can prevent yourself from getting cancer if you, if you gear up properly when you use herbicides. Okay. Um, is it safe or can we direct water from a sump pump into a garden? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Water is water and, uh, you know, it's it's even probably even have more minerals, so it's it's just fine. Yeah. Some pumps are just fine. Yeah. So is roof runoff and surface runoff. So whatever you whatever water source you got, use it. Use it. Okay. Um, we have and somebody reminded me. Thank you. It was Tower Lakes, not Deer Park. And Andy Hay was oh, okay. who presented about um, their stormwater management project. Very good. Um, we have a few people who are giving um, possible sites where people can find, um, would be able to find native plants, um, including naturalgardennatives.com. There's a where to buy page. So just sharing the wealth. Okay. Um, Very good. And I think these two kind of go together. One is what kind of maintenance do I need to do once my prairie garden is established? 
and should you mulch a bed that is planted with native plants? Well, um, if, if I'm doing a, um, a planting just with plugs, at first there's going to be space in between that, so I do use leaf mulch okay. and those plugs can travel through leaf mulch with no problem and bust through it. Um, I've even seeded native, native, native seed into leaf mulch and it's done well. So um, there's, there's not an issue there. I, I would stay more away from the big uh, wood chip type stuff um, and, and use, use more nutrient rich um, kinds of, uh, but um, uh, typically, you know, once it's, once it's established, you don't need to mulch very much because it'll be so dense. Okay, and mm -hmm. similarly with other kind of other kind of maintenance. Oh, the maintenance, the prairie maintenance is 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 kind of a, a little bit of a science. Um, there's um, um, a need to that first year to probably weed whack uh, or hand pull your weeds um, probably about three times to four times a season uh, to make sure. The main thing is to weed whack it at the time before the, it goes to seed. So if the thistle's getting close to that point, you want to get it out of there. Uh, you don't want it to seed itself in. So uh, weed whacking is going to be your friend that first year in a, in a seeded prairie. Um, and um, But years two and three, you start moving into um, um, a, 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 mu a much more healthy, healthy prairie. But that first year, you are going to, you are going to need to weed it three to five times. Okay. Um... We have someone asking for a suggestion for an oak that would do well in sun and not wet. Sun and not wet. Um, a white oak is the state tree. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is certainly Quercus alba uh, would be a, a great, a great tree. Uh, bur oak would be a, a secondary tree that would do really, you know, superbly well. Um, but if you've got, again, some room, because they, they both are big specimen trees over time. Okay, they're going to take a little while. Or, um, and it's like five, it'll only take 500 years before it's, you know, yeah. fully mature, but. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had to replace a parkway tree and part of right. me really wanted to do an oak and part of me was like, but I'm not going to live here for that long. So. Well, it's, it's funny, oaks will put on about 18 inches of growth every year, so mm -hmm. they're not as you think okay. but it does but it does take time to get that mighty mighty look yeah yeah um i know the library owns at least three of douglas tallamy's books i had to rebuy the first one that you mentioned i can't remember the title of it right now bringing nature home bringing nature home um, yes. i had to rebuy that one because our copy either fell apart or walked off so, gotcha. so we, we added that back to our collection and he has a new book i don't know if it's i think it's coming out later this month that is more specifically about trees and i think specifically about oaks correct so yes yeah. it's just coming out i want to get it myself yep. yeah yeah so something to think about um That's and then you mentioned pagoda dogwoods um pagoda dogwood is a plant um, yeah. It's very versatile. It has a, a kind of a horizontal, interesting branching structure. Um, it's it's a it's a wonderful plant. Okay. What about a kusa? And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that pr properly. K o u s a, kusa dogwood. Um, that that one's a little mysterious to me. Um, okay. I have yeah. Uh, um, it's just not ringing it ringing a bell. Okay, so maybe do me. a little research to verify yeah. it's native. Yeah, there, to there, there are cultivars, so that might be a cultivar, Nate, uh, a cultivar um, off of, off of you know, your native dogwood. Okay, mm -hmm. um, which, the, great segue, um, what is your opinion of the plants that are called nativars? Nativars, well, this is kind of a, a mini controversial subject um, in the sense that, uh, uh, some folks think they're they're more beautiful, and again, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Um, but uh, they they look and they're a little more lush. They 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 may bloom longer. Um, they're they're designed. They're they're biologically designed to perform like like other cultivar plants uh, that are bred uh, for their beauty or an at or specific attribute. 
Um, I, I typically don't use native Rs myself and only because I, I feel that genetically there could be a difference between uh, allowing the insect world to get past the defenses. So I don't know if the, the plant defenses are the same for a native R than the real deal. So that's that's the only the only hesitancy that I have because you know this whole thing is really about the life cycle and and having having uh, you know um, but if if someone can do a study and maybe there's been one that shows native Rs uh, provide the same nutrient level the same kind of benefits for the insects I'm all you know then then okay. you know go for it so to speak particularly around your house would I want uh, would I encourage native R U forest preserve? No, I'd say it's the real deal. That's what you're there for is, is the, the native flora and fauna. But um, if, or around your house, you know, if there's a particular look that you're looking for, and and I often blend existing non-native plants with native plants. Okay. So um, you know, around your home, you can be a little, you know, you can certainly be. It's it's your house so you can do what you want <laughs> but but if you can use natives great use natives uh, and if you, if you want to throw native R in there you know I don't think this would be the end of the world okay um we have someone else who just threw in chat that kusa dogwoods are native to Asia so there's your answer well, there you go um, okay. maybe that's why I just don't do well with the Asian plants I don't know yeah yeah and I'm about to cut down a maple that the Japanese maple previous owners planted here so um are there any species of hydrangeas that are native to this area? Yes, um, there there are um, oak leaf hydrangea. I believe is okay. is native. Um, I'm not sure it's native to Lake County per se. I'd have to look okay. look that up, but but I, I do do believe that that that's a native hydrangea. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've got just two more. And then I, oh, actually, I'm sorry, three more. Um, and they're very, they're vastly different, so I can't really categorize them. Um, okay. One is asking about oak saplings. They have many oak saplings on their property. Mm -hmm. How and when do they, can they be transplanted? Well, the best time is now, or certainly early spring is, okay. is the best time, or fall okay. would be, the, those would be the two times um, at, towards the end of October. October, uh, early November, um, it's, and get some water on them in the fall okay. too. Don't just, I'll just don't, yeah, always water after you transplant, give it lots of water yeah. and, and, and minimize the time that it's out of the ground in the air. Okay. So dig your hole first, where you're going to put it, then dig your plant up then put it in quickly and then water it. Okay. So and keep, seed. and keep watering it. Okay. Yeah. So seed is of the essence. And not yes. Bigger. Okay. Right. Um, it, I'll just ask this. Any ideas of what to plant along the shoreline that muskrats will not eat? Well, uh, they certainly love cattails. So, um, and no, nobody, nobody's planting cattails, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, but um, um, that's, I, it's a lot of sedges um, and, um, I haven't seen them decimate um, pickerel weed, for example. That's that's a native a native that does well. Um, um, again, you know, they're a critter that's going to, you know, eat eat native native plants because that's what they like. Um, but they they look they're going to like like a lot of plants with with tubers, for example. So Sagittaria, latifolia is um, arrowhead. That's got a tuber to it. They, they, it's also known as duck potato. So that's a plant that, that might, might be dug up more so than, than the pickerel weed. So, um, but that's a, that's a darn good question. And um, um, I, I would use uh, some bulrushes and use some, some things that are really got a, a sturdy amount of, of plant material coming out of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the, the key is density. If you're putting in more plants than less, you're you're going to be better off. Okay, okay. Um, I lied. Two more questions now. Um, one is: Are there native species of willows? 
uh, yes, there there are. Um, I think it's black willow, and there's a, a real um, almost invasive shrub uh, called sandbar willow, okay. uh, which has been used quite a bit along some shoreline restorations. Uh, but it creates a thicket, and it gets tall and big, and you can't really see through it. Okay. So you, it needs a very special application for sandbar willow, for example. Be careful where you use. Yeah. It. Okay. yeah. And then you mentioned sedges several times um, during your presentation. Uh, can can you talk about or are you familiar at all with um, low or no mow lawns? Yes, yes, I've used them uh, in on several occasions, and um, the no mow lawn is more or less a fescue that has deeper roots than your typical turf grass. Um, it has more of a clumpy feel to it and it can be mowed once a year or twice a year or, or not mowed at all. Um, some of the nurseries that I provided in the presentation uh, sell the product uh, Prairie Moon Nursery as well as Prairie Nursery uh, sell um, both of those um, um, and there's just go just Google Prairie Nursery or Prairie Moon Nursery. Okay. One's in Wisconsin and the second one's in uh, Minnesota. And uh, you can buy that product. Um, and I've used it uh, um, as an alternative to, to turf grass. Okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I will thank you to all the folks who um, put resources in the chat and I will um, compile those and um, put them in the, um, along with the YouTube video, I will put all of those in the in the information below it. So you'll have to you have to do the see more. Um, oh, there we go. Susan, Susan yeah, already has the Susan. book. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you, Susan. got the book right away, the nature book. <laughs> and we do, yep. I know I bought a copy for the library. So, um, so there yeah, we go. The nature of oaks. Yeah, he's a great writer. He will not bore you. He's an entomologist. Yeah. Uh, an esteemed entomology professor from the University of Delaware, and I can't say enough about Doug Ptolemy. He's changed my view uh, of how important the insect world is. That's fascinating. That's really interesting. I have a bunch of people who are saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, sure. Much been my pleasure. It's what I do. I enjoyed this very much. I am going to throw a quick, um, and I meant to mention this at the beginning and I forgot, I am, um, somebody said sedges have edges. That's how yes. you know the difference between a grass and a sedge. Um, They're triangular, kind of a triangular blade and um, many are wet, can, can uh, they, they have a, um, they, they have a high, some have a really high tolerance for being underwater and in water and, and some don't. There are drier sedges um, that occur as well and there's woodland sedges that occur. So. Uh, in drier regimes. So it's a, it's a wide variety, um, but uh, there are, there, it's a great plant grass family, so to speak, and uh, I encourage you to, to use them. They're, they're, they're beautiful. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, April is, among other things, Earth Month. Um, April 22nd specifically is Earth Day. And I've done library programs on Earth Day in the past, and what I have learned is that a lot of the local environmental groups do work days on Earth Day, and I do not want to detract from that. So I'm not doing a program on Earth Day, um, but that week, um, Monday, April 19th, I'm doing a program with Go Green Barrington. Um, I just put the link in the chat on um, someone from the Cook County Forest Preserve talking about reducing waste and then recycling, recycling right. How can you, um, how can you recycle properly? Susan wants everyone to know um, that they can register at. I'm gonna just type the the link into the chat. Um, you can register at backtrust.org for a workday at Peterson Preserve. You can look at that. Um, and again, thank you very very much. Say the name of your business one more time. Sure, uh, I'm Dave Eubanks and uh, eubanksenvironmental.com, 847-456-5604. Uh, and uh, I'd love to work with anybody that enjoys native plants. Thank you. Great, thank you so, so much. 
And everyone, I will share the link to the recording as soon as I have it ready. And please pass it along to any of your friends. Great. Thank you all. Thank you.